folks, it is the return once again of our Mark's reading series. Hello, David. How are you? I'm not bad, brother. How are you? I'm excited to be returning to this. I like doing these sorts of things. I'm a book club sort of nerd, uh, <laughs> uh, and it's good to always return to texts. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, Marx writings, one of the earliest that ever made an impression on me. This is assigned to me in my uh, 19th century philosophy class in undergrad at Minnesota State University at Moorhead. And I remember the uh, thinking about the everybody have time to be a uh, <laughs> shepherd. I can't remember the exact line. We'll, we'll play it later. But a herdsman, a critic. Uh, and that really spoke to me, not least because I had no idea what my fucking major <laughs> was going to be at that point. <laughs> and uh, not having to make a decision uh, was nice. But uh, I'm excited to uh, be talking about this with you, David. Yeah, man. I mean, um, I think we'll have a little bit of an introduction. But, you know, this is an important text for a few a few reasons. Um, I think both historically as like, you know, people who want to study Marx is like recognize. I mean, this is the beginning of, of his of his materialist uh, turn um, or actually it's not the beginning because there's like there's there's hints of it in some of the other sections that we've actually done is criticism of of Hegel, um, another of the young Hegelians and the Feuerbach. Um, mm -hmm. But this is really like if it's not the, you know, the early murmurings, I mean, this is like the outspoken break uh, with a certain kind of popular philosophy at the time. In the beginning of Marxism, like like Marx's like theory of of of, of history and of politics and 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 philosophy, and yeah, it's it's very worthwhile. Um, we're going to be moving um, primarily from a, a set, long section, um, but a section of the German ideology, uh, part one, um, section A. Which, if y'all want to, um, you know, read this, we'll put uh, a link in the the bottom. I highly suggest just come through. It's about seventeen pages. Um, print it out. So, you know, something you can do in an hour or two if you want to. I think it's, um, you'll definitely understand it better um, if, if you read it and, and listen to this. Maybe listen to this first and then read it after. Um, but it's a, uh, it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a fundamental text. And it's fun. I was saying to Matt before, it's fun coming back to some of these, like, you know, from being like a baby Marxist and being like, I got to read, you know, all these things and sort of, you know, grappling with it and wrestling with it and coming back like many years later, once you've incorporated a lot of this thought into your own thinking um, and maybe having a deeper understanding of what he's getting at um, in, in a lot of these places. Yeah. So uh, Marx is in his late twenties, I believe he's living in Brussels. I got this section from this Jonathan Sperber. I think it's Sperber, the only from audible stickers covering the author's name uh, on this. Um, but uh, Sperber, a 19th Karl Marx, a 19th century life. Let's we'll play this for a little bit of the intro and kind of uh, for this book, which the full title is called <clears throat> uh, a, uh, <laughs> A German Ideology Critique of Modern German Philosophy According to Its Representatives Feuerbach, B. Bauer, and Stirner, and the German Social and German Socialism According to Its Various Prophets. Uh, and so you know, we're just going to call it the German Ideology. Um, here is uh, this intro from Sperber. Let me slow that down first. When the bourgeoisie ended the rule of the feudal nobility, Marx's second major theoretical effort during his time in Brussels is commonly known as the German ideology, although, as the researchers on the new mega have painstakingly demonstrated, such a work does not and never did exist. The German ideology, as book title, appears only once in a letter to the editor Marx wrote in 1847, announcing that one volume of a two-volume work would not be appearing in print, in the surviving manuscripts, the line, ideology in general and the German ideology in particular, designates a chapter. This dissection of a title may seem picky and pedantic, but it is important, because the manuscripts of what is known as the German ideology were not one intellectually consistent enterprise. They evolved in erratic fashion, acquiring and shedding co-authors and differing in argument and proposed method of publication between their origin in late 1845 to early 1846 and their final abandonment by mid-1847. The work began as a collaboration between Marx, Engels, and Hess. It was to contain critiques of the young Hegelian radicals along the lines of the Holy Family, 
that were to appear as a series of articles to be published in the proposed revival of the Franco-German yearbooks. Parts of this original emphasis continued throughout the project. In particular, criticism of one of the young Hegelians reached enormous length. As the manuscript expanded, Marx began to think of it as a book, and increasingly a two-volume work. The first volume would be a biting critique of the young Hegelians. The second, an equally savage attack on the true socialists, a group of German intellectuals professing socialist ideas. Moses Hess was, in many ways, the intellectual leader of the true socialists. So that a project beginning as a collaboration among Marx, Engels, and Hess ended up as an assault on Hess's own ideas. Since Hess had introduced Marx to socialism and strongly influenced his initial concepts of it, the denunciation of the true socialists was a form of veiled self-criticism. You, you kind of see uh, some of the uh, idiosyncrasies of uh, working with Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it makes me think of like a podcast, like, like let's come together as all political podcasts and then you just start um, like having drama because there's just ide uh, ideological or personal ideological uh, arguments that get in the way. But uh, uh, yeah, this is why we're sticking to like the first bit, like one a there is, it, it goes further and, you know, maybe we return and pick at some of the um, uh, later parts of the, it's a long, much longer work, but it does get very specific into these different mm -hmm. figures. Um, like, <laughs> um with some very comical sort of titles like i'll just read like uh kind of quasi saint max uh his oh, the oh, like making fun of saint bruno um bruno mm -hmm. bauer the oh, young hegelian so like making fun of them as like quasi religious uh figures uh, which they would hate you're exactly like new messiahs because you say like yeah because they were critics of religion but yeah exactly Oh, yeah. and I have one other thing too. Mm -hmm. Like, so um, this is just from the uh, volume uh, collected works, uh, volume five intro. Um, uh, but this is a section that, uh, and let's see what you think of the Davis, uh, David. In the German ideology, Marx and Engels not only developed in all of its aspects the thesis of the decisive role of material production in the life of society, which they had already formulated in their previous works, they also revealed for the first time the dialectics of the development of the productive forces and the relations of production. This most important discovery was formulated here as the dialectics of the productive forces and the form of intercourse. It illuminated the whole conceptual si system of historical materialism and made it possible to expound the substance of, mater of the materialist way of understanding history as an integral scientific conception. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's that's the, a pretty solid like summing up of it. I mean, this is this is where you get a lot of the basic building blocks of of Marxism, particularly like in relation to society and 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 history, um, which is why you know the Marxist analysis is is something that is still usable um, today because it's very applicable, not only towards looking, um, you know, at history like sitting from Marx in eighteen forty five, but at looking at history. For us today, 2022, looking at the movements of societies over the past 150 plus uh, years as well. Like this is a yeah, this is a very fundamental um, text. And like, you know, there. so there's like a couple things I think are worth like remember when we're going into it. There's like two things. There's the criticism of like idealism as like a, as a philosophy and as a tool for understanding society. Some of Marx very much disagrees with. Um, while also looking at the kind of general historical progressions of, of society. So there's two aspects the criticism of idealism in favor of materialism, and then also like a working out of like what a materialist view of, of history would look like. Mm -hmm. um, so the first, and you might want to listen to our episode on the thesis of Feuerbach, because I yeah. feel like the early part of this is sort of a, uh, a summation of that. Um, but here is, I think, the preface. This is just uh, uh, three minutes here, but uh, a good sort of overview of, uh, of what we uh, talked about there, too. A Critique of the German Ideology by Karl Marx Preface Hitherto, men have constantly made up for themselves false conceptions about themselves, about what they are and what they ought to be. They have arranged their relationships according to their ideas of God, of normal man, etc. The phantoms of their brains have got out of their hands. 
They, the creators, have bowed down before their creations. Let us liberate them from the... That line, especially when I was an atheist as an undergrad, really got to me. And that is really a, a rehash of Feuerbach, um, mm -hmm. what we talk about there. But the creations of their minds, they bowed down before them. Like, damn, man. The chimeras, the ideas, dogmas, imaginary beings under the yoke of which they are pining away. Let us revolt against the rule of thoughts. Let us teach men, says one, to exchange these imaginations for thoughts which correspond to the essence of man. Says the second, to take up a critical attitude to them. Says the third, to knock them out of their heads. And existing reality will collapse. These innocent and childlike fancies are the kernel of the modern young Hegelian philosophy, which not only is received by the German public with horror and awe, but is announced by our philosophic heroes with the solemn consciousness of its cataclysmic dangerousness and criminal ruthlessness. The first volume of the present publication has the aim of uncloaking these sheep, who take themselves and are taken for wolves, <laughs> of showing how their bleating merely imitates in a philosophic form the conceptions of the German middle class. How the boasting of these philosophic commentators only mirrors the wretchedness of the real conditions in Germany. It is its aim to debunk and discredit the philosophic struggle with the shadows of reality, which appeals to the dreamy and muddled German nation. Once upon a time, a valiant fellow had the idea that men were drowned in water only because they were possessed with the idea of gravity. If they were to knock this notion out of their heads, say by stating it to be a superstition, a religious concept, they would be sublimely proof against any danger from water. His whole life long he fought against the illusion of gravity, of whose harmful results all statistics brought him new and manifold evidence. This valiant fellow was the type of the new revolutionary philosophers in Germany. <laughs> So there you go, Mark Spicy in the preface. Yeah, well, he'll be spicy throughout the the text, like you know, and like I mean, we're gonna we're really gonna um, hunker down and get into you know his, his criticism here, but like I mean, that comical example is making it very clear, it's like this idea that it is you know ideas that create reality versus reality creating ideas is that the fundamental is like what Marx is fundamentally trying to break with, um, with you know the the whole or at least of, of like dominant German philosophy. And I don't know if we're ready to jump in um, to the opening bit, because like um, so the, the first section of the text, um, this is part one, um, part A of it. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. You know, he opens up with what he calls the illusions of the German ideology. And we're not going to jump into this entire section, except to note that, you know, he's writing at this time of like significant upheaval in German society, um, you know, rapid change in, in, in history, not just in Germany, but all across Europe. And uh, he says here, um, you know, criticizing all of these these folks, um, basically lining out their idea that heroes of the mind overthrew each other with unheard of rapid rapidity. Um, and in the three years, 1842 to 1845, more of the past was swept away in Germany um, than any other time in three centuries. Right. And it's right that like a lot of stuff has been changed um, in society. Uh, but here's Marx kind of dig at the people who are basically saying this is an ideas revolution. All of this is supposed to have taken place in the realm of pure thought, right? So he's really hitting at, at these people who are refusing to sort of look at the fundamental changes in in in, in production, um, in like early capitalism in in in, in Germany, um, and in like politics at large. There, with you know, just being you know different thesis, like different ideas winning out over other ideas. Um, something that Marx is very, very much against. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, later uh, in the same section uh, is the young Hegelian uh, ideologists, in spite of their allegedly world shattering statements are the staunchest conservatives. The most recent of them have found the correct expression for their activity when they declare they're only fighting against phrases. They forget, however, that these phrases, they themselves are only opposing other phrases and that they are in no way combating the real existing world when they are merely combating phrases of this world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um again like i think a, a pretty solid dig at like a very popular movement in 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 germany at the time um you know where it's like you know again like if you are really interested in this stuff 
I do suggest just going back and listening to our um, episode on uh, on uh, criticisms of, of Hegel's philosophy of right, um, where we're mm. really going to get into some of the philosophical uh, differences. We really spent a lot of time getting into like outlining what the young Hegelians and what Hegel's philosophy of, of history and society were there. Um, I think because this is such a rich text in some of the things that I think are like novel at the time, some of the arguments that he's making that are, are new. Um, we're going to focus more on that. But like, if you're really interested in like hearing that those two ideas being hashed out, um, I suggest going there. But yeah, like, you know, so basically we're set up now um, in this kind of fight between, um, you know, philosophical fight between Marx and, you know, these young Hegelians who are, you know, saying we're going to change people's ideas. We're going to fight against phrases that we think, you know, hide the truth um, instead of like looking to, toward um, society uh, at at large, right? And like he says right before that section that um, Matt read, um, you know, the young Hegelians demand to change consciousness amounts to a demand to interpret reality in another way, to recognize it by uh, means of another interpretation. And Marx just finds that to be a flat out wrong way to think um, about the the movements in, in history and society. Um, but we can jump into this, the materials method, I think, because this is, this is where it starts to get juicy. Um, so this this first section after the kind of introduction, um, Marx lays out the first premise of materialist, um, of the materialist method. Um, and what this really, um, is about is like the existence of living human individuals. And he opens up by saying the premises, uh, from which I can uh, play this too, by the way. Okay. Yeah. If you have, that's sure. easier for me. Got it queued up right here. First premises of materialist method. The premises from which we begin are not arbitrary ones, not dogmas, but real premises from which abstraction can only be made in the imagination. They are the real individuals. Their activity and the material conditions under which they live, both those which they find already existing and those produced by their activity. These premises can thus be verified in a purely empirical way. The first premise of all human history is, of course, the existence of living human individuals. Thus, the first fact to be established is the physical organization of these individuals and their consequent relation to the rest of nature. Of course, we cannot here go either into the actual physical nature of man or into the natural conditions in which man finds himself, geological, hydrographical, climatic, and so on. The writing of history must always set out from these natural bases, and their modification in the course of history through the action of men. Men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you like. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. That um, section there is something that I, 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 it has stuck with me, but I think I like attributed it to Locke or something like that, mm. but it's obviously very Marxian. Like man becomes man when they, uh, let me just read it again. Um, uh, 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 shoot, shoot, where, where did I scroll? Oh, here it is. Um, they themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. Uh, by producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. Like I, I've always thought that is a very like sort of deep uh, philosophical statement. Absolutely, and like this is also what sets up history at large, right? This is like what, what creates the opportunity for us to, to be living in something that we call history versus just like, I don't know, natural life. I mean, this is the separation of, of, of human beings, um, from, from animals in the way that like, is once you start being able to produce the, 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 um, the products, the things that you need to actually survive, it creates a whole host of other needs as we'll get into to later. And like this, um, really is, and he'll, he'll say it more explicitly later, like some of the first acts of, of, of history once we're start able, starting to be able to produce our own um, 
needs, right? Produce commodities to, uh, you know, satisfy our, our needs. Because once you start doing that, then you start getting different kinds of needs that start to arise, um, you know, that further start to separate us from just like the le level of just pure subsistence into something of like a higher, uh, you know, experience of being. Um, and then um, from that, like it starts to create different tensions and contradictions within human society based on where you are in production, based on what things that are needing to be produced, based on where you get sort of placed in the division of labor. I mean, this is like a very radical uh, moment in the beginnings of, you know, human society at large. Um, and again, it's coming from, you know, like these things are, are um, through like the act of, of, of producing, we're not only just meeting our needs, we're also producing society. And this is like where Marx, I think, really um, is is different from even some of the other kind of like natural um, state um, philosophers too, right? Mm. Like the, you know, um, you know, that are very dominant in, in the Enlightenment because he takes that understanding and, and, and really modernizes it. I mean, you get a bit of that with like um, Rousseau, but Rousseau is such a puzzle because I think you could take a lot of different positions on what it is that Rousseau actually wants. Like Rousseau has that famous line, like, you know, the worst crime in human history was the, like the creation of private property, something I can't remember exactly the text, but it's like, you know, the first um, crime against like our natural state um, was once somebody put up a fence essentially. Um, right. And then that sort of set us up into this inequality. And like, I think that Marx's understanding is actually much deeper because um, those, those processes actually um, really, opened up uh, the possibility for something much, much uh, grander um, than any kind of like return to like a primitive state of, uh, you know, producing and, and engaging with one another. Yeah. Should we uh, keep rolling this a little bit? Yeah, let's do it. Distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. The way in which men produce their means of subsistence depends first of all on the nature of the actual means of subsistence they find in existence and have to reproduce. This mode of production must not be considered simply as being the production of the physical existence of the individuals. Rather, it is a definite form of activity of these individuals, a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and with how they produce. It's just, just very interesting to think about, um, you know, I mean, your mind can go all sorts of directions. You think of, you know, the Kowalski from Nebraska calling in from his tractor, uh, mm -hmm. right? Or I was, we were just talking with those Utah boys um, about, like, what the job careers are. And you basically, like, because it's all Mormon uh, um, sort of culture, there's, like, you go into sales for multi-level marketing, right? And it's, like, or you can think of it in, like, the natural state of, like, okay, I'm able to, like... I have this plot of land and we're able to farm this and look at this surplus um, to take us through the winter and that sort of thing. Like it, it and it, and it is sort of determinative of, mm -hmm. uh, of so much. And, and everybody has an understanding of this on a pretty basic level, right? Like what's one of the first things you talk about on a date? Like what's uh, um, like the, your relationship to how you're sustaining yourself is mm -hmm. foundational really. I totally, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And like, um, he, you know, makes the argument that as population increases, like through this, this production, um, it, it also changes the way that we relate with one another. And I think that one thing that's really important, um, to remember Harvey, Oh, I guess you have the, the interview that will be out with Harvey on Tuesday. We talk about this briefly. Um, but it's important to remember, for example, you know, that class for is, is a relation. It's a relation, um, between people. And I think a lot of folks miss that aspect of, of Marxist thinking that like these things aren't sort of, these things affect you individually, but they are constructed collectively. And that's why these things have to be social struggle. That's why like, you know, a lot of times like you get these kind of fantasies uh, from people on the left that it's like, 
you know, we're going to go back to the land and like, you know, leave this or that. And I, as an individual, basically overcome the contradictions of, of society. And, you know, Marx and Marxism, like uh, very much like disagrees with that conception um, because it is your relation to others, your relation to society, your relation to production that ends up uh, defining you. So if you want to sort of move the ball forward, if you want to, um, you know, affect those relations, these things have to be kind of collective society wide struggle versus you going on like a personal journey of like self expression, um, uh, or self realization, uh, which again, I think like really, really defines it compared to like, you know, we talk, I talk about this a lot in the American context, it absolutely was happening in Marxist time, you always have these like socialists who are like, what we're going to do is we're going to create like a little town, and we're going to have like a socialist, um, you know, society. And it's never taken off or worked um, right. compared to like uh, revolutionary models that have sort of seized society and reshaped it. Um, because at the end of the day, like at your highest stage, when you're relating with um, society, right? Like at a certain point, your town or your community has to relate uh, with with the rest of uh, with the rest of the world, which is you know, going to define like your way of being. And two, just like on a practical political level, it's just like, you're never going to be able to develop production um, to the level that it exists, like in society at large to be able to compete and create like a alternative model um, to this kind of thing, which is something that I think um, is worthwhile to remember, because especially in moments of like political despair, <laughs> I think a lot of people are like, well, we're not gonna be able to win politically, we're not gonna be able to win at large. So like, I'm just going to retreat into the small community. Um, to be able to influence uh, the world. And um, it's a bit wrongheaded. Yeah. I mean, basically I think it's like, I, I don't think we get to this. This is in section B, but like um, he's talking about like the steam engine is required for certain types of liberation yeah. and uh, that sort of stuff. Um, I, uh, then he gets into a section in 1A here, back to where we're uh, reading from, um, about the division of labor and forms of property and uh, different stages. Uh, you have the tribal, the ancient and feudal uh, he goes into, and also a discussion of town and country, yes. uh, which I always thought was very interesting. Uh, uh, you know, basically Rome was the uh, sort of city model. Um, and then the feudal era was more uh, country because you have landed estates uh, and that sort of thing. Um, anything you thought was interesting from this yeah. section, David? I mean, I'm going to go over a couple of things. I don't think we need to read long sections or anything like that. But, um, you know, he makes this argument, which we've hinted at before. And this is like the, you know, one of the engines of, of the argument is that each new productive uh, force, insofar as it is not merely a quantitative extension of productive forces already known, for instance, the bringing into cultivation of fresh land causes a further um, development of the division of, of labor. And why is this? It's because as we were saying earlier, it creates new needs, like right? you know, um, if you're going from a society that is doing like hunter gathering stuff, um, and then you start doing you know early forms of agriculture, well, then you also have um, needs that are separate from that. You need tools, you need you know cultivation um, technologies, and you need people to be producing those. So now, like your needs are growing as your ability to basically meet your basic needs, um, you know, are getting stronger. We're also getting more and more needs in society for, you know, other kinds of things. And like, um, I think this is something that people understand sort of intuitively, um, but it's a very important to understand that the relationship between, um, you know, growing productive forces also creating more and more needs. And like, you could think about that in a modern context. Um, electricity is something that is definitely um, a, a, a basic human need at this point because of the way that we live, because of the way that we interact with each other. So as we become more advanced productively, uh, we also have different kinds of needs that are, are, are growing um, as, as, as those new productive forces come into being. And they create these kind of tensions in society. As Matt was saying, uh, I think this town versus country is actually a very, very um, good example because I think it's something that people grasp intuitively in the sense that like, yes, depending on where you live, that affects who you are and what you do. Um, and this, there's a big difference between people who are living in more urban or town environments versus people who are living, um, you know, in, in, in the country and, and subsisting primarily from ap agricultural, um, labor. And he goes, um, the methods employed in agriculture, industry, and commerce, um, um, 
patriarchalism, uh, slavery, estates, classes, these same conditions are to be seen given a more developed in course, uh, intercourse in the relations of different nations uh, to one another and recognizing that, um, you know, as these forms are be growing and becoming more complicated, now we have a new form of interaction with people, not just the family, not just like the tribe or, or the, you know, the town, um, but, you know, these kind of newer forms of, of social organization being the, the nation. Um, and he says, I'll just read this longer block, block quote out. Um, the various stages of development in the division of labor are just so many different forms of ownership. In essence, the existing stage in the division of labor determine determines also the relations of individuals to one another with reference to the material instrument and production of labor. And unless you had anything to add to that, I, I, I don't think we need to read through the entirety of these um, different early forms of ownership and, and production, but I have some, some uh, quick notes on ancient and communal state ownership. Um, you know, the ancient or the first form of, uh, you know, is, is tribal, which is effectively like a slow but expansion of like the family, right? Like the family being like the first block and then the family sort of getting, growing outside of that into more tribal forms of, of production and, and organization. Um, and he says, you know, some things um, here about you know, this making possible, for example, the relationship of, of slavery, which is very prominent in early, uh, you know, human society. Um, and he says the slavery latent in the family only develops gradually with the increase of population, the growth of wants, and with the extension of external relations, both of war and of barter. Um, and, you know, the mm. of labor there is still like very early in its development. Um, um, and the only natural division of labor is existing in the family. But he argues that the system of, of, of slavery is actually something um, that sort of is an outgrowth of the kind of top down order of the family in the sense of like the patriarchal system. Of I mean, how, order, you know, you look at American slavery and like the way, like, I mean, obviously you have the major plantations where you have, mm -hmm. you know, giant, um, uh, like hundreds of slaves, but uh, like the, um, uh, more like sort of middle-class ownership of slave that was like to, uh, um, maintain a level of domesticity that mm -hmm. could only be, uh, uh, achieved, um, if your wife is going to be sort of uh, like, uh, um, unless she's going to be on her hands and knees scrubbing the floors every day through slavery. So, I mean, that, I mean, that connection and that's at that time, right? This is and, the 1840s. Yeah. And like, that's like an advanced system of, of this early system too. Right. But like, right. Of course. You know, and, but not, no, I mean, like, and not to skip too far ahead, but if you look at the production of ideology, like if you read as Matt has spent a lot of time, like reading, like the thought process of, of slaveholders, there is all of this kind of language of like how to be a good slave owner. You have to take care of them like a father takes care of, of their children, right? Like you produce an ideology that attaches itself to the the system of production that you're living under, right? Mm -hmm. And this like sim similar kind of things, if you look at like, you know, philosophers from antiquity, like there is all of this stuff about like what is proper um, when it comes to dealing with the slave business in the Bible. You know, like these things develop, these kind of social ideas develop out, out of them. Um, and, and, and the point here is like to recognize the kernel. It's not necessarily like some guy as much was like created like the best argument for like thinking about these things. It was that because society was being governed and organized in a certain sense, the idea, the ideology to like, not just justify it, um, but, you know, quote unquote, um, don't understand me wrong here, like perfect it, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, develops um, alongside of it. And he talks um, then about like, so out of the tribal form of ownership, you have the, what he calls the ancient communal and state ownership. And, you know, he designate this as like, you know, when you start to get tribe, tribal governments, tribal, like um, society sort of merging together, two basic ways that he says that this happens either through confederation, like out of free um, out of need and, 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 and consent tribes sort of joining together or through war, right. Or through just conquering uh, your neighbors and putting them under your control. But what is the, the mode of production here? Um, he argues that it's a form of uh, communal ownership. Um, private property is subordinate to communal uh, ownership in the early um, form of uh, ancient and communal state ownership. And how so um, he argues that slavery, which is like the, 
the the main mode of production in that period of time um, is something that only has power coming out of community in the sense that like it is not solely through your individual authority that you're able to maintain this, but through right. through the community, through the the kind of understandings and the way that people thought about other people at the time through utilizing um, society to sort of punish, uh, you know, a, a slave worker. Um, you know, who steps outside of that, 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 uh, what they're, what it is that they're supposed to do. Um, it is something that is relying on the community. So therefore, um, even though like maybe a family might own, um, you know, slaves, um, it is a communal ownership because it is, it's necessitated on the existence of the, that kind of communal structure. Right. Exactly. I mean, this is where you get like slave catching acts and stuff like that. Mm. Right. Like if an individual, you know, fancy boy like Jefferson, uh, like he'd be turned on very quickly if he couldn't rely on the rest of like the sort of um, gentry militia to um, help him like turn back a slave revolt or something. And I, I think you can see a lot of the kernels in there, but I think it's important to understand like the historical development that this early form of like ancient mm. And, and 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 communal like slavery and also like production is is different from um like the american context in the sense that like it wasn't so attached to for example like a global market where like the price of cotton yeah. is like affecting the the treatment of, of slaves in like the, those ancient um systems but absolutely like i think that you know the the point is is, is correct though that like the communal like aspect of this is a necessary precondition um for for slavery both in the ancient version and like the later American plantation system. Um, then he goes on to, to Rome and I don't know, are you a big Rome history guy, Matt? I'm not, I've dabbled, but never done. I, I don't have a super good lay of the land, to be honest. It's one of those things where I feel like there's a time in, in American history um, that has sort of been lost where like that was very, very well known. Oh yeah. Classics education and is a little bit less so, but um, you know, he makes the, the argument about um um, in, in Rome that like out of, um, a concentration of, of property that happens very rapidly, um, towards the end of the, the Republic and the rise of the Imperial system in Rome, um, you start to see a huge concentration of, of private property. You start to see that system start to become very dominant in a way that it hadn't in, in, in society, at least in Europe, um, previous to that. Um, and he makes an interesting argument here, um, about, the plebeians and uh, the proletarian basically argues that under in Rome during that period of time, you start to see, um, you know, the plebeian small peasantry turn into a proletariat. But because um, the proletariat was so defined, actually, as a class in between um, property citizens and slaves, it doesn't create its own kind of independent development. Um from those two classes, because it is like very much defined at like the fundamental tension at that period of time was between slaves and citizens. Um, and even though there is this other class that is growing, um, it is really much like determined by the fact that it's sort of a middle in between position between uh, being enslaved and being like a property proper citizen of of Rome. And um, as much as I think we could dive into more of that, I think that that's good enough for now because Rome gets really yeah. fascinating with like the concept of the people in Rome being something that's like you have citizens and that's like in confers like rights to vote. But the people had a lot of of, of, of power in Rome, which is always an interesting thing um, to realize that even in a kind of like slave and unequal society like that, there was this concept of like the people, which is that you always had to appeal to, even if um their 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 like forms of political power weren't as as developed um but you see them like start to develop pretty um significantly ironically um in like the late republic early like imperial period um but uh that's a whole other monster i think to get into uh versus yeah, yeah. Uh, the, these developments i i just like the discussion of uh brief about how serfs and peasants escaping to yeah. the city but they're emancipating themselves not as a class but as individuals um mm -hmm. you kind of see why he'll later focus on industrial workers because you have both the concentration of uh workers like not individually able to emancipate themselves on capital but uh yeah, the surfs escaping is. Um, so then he goes to 
Um, now, the essence of the materialist conception of history, social being, and social consciousness. This, as a communication studies uh, major, was interesting to me <laughs> to talk about language as, like, yeah, duh. Like, you don't have language to, like, you know, talk to yourself. Wait, before we, before we jump in that next section, just, like, one more thing on, on mm-hmm. feudalism. Because yeah. you mentioned it, but it's just, like, for people who haven't read it yet. Um, he argues that antiquity like the the great greek civilizations the great roman civilization um comes out of the town right like the town being the center of life but right. in the middle ages society emanates from the country and he argues that again like this is the materialist understanding of history versus it being about like oh ideas are changing it was like the conditions of life were changing in europe so you see a massive d- decline in population you see people spreading out across Europe into the country. So you don't have that same kind of like organization around the city. Um, so, you know, feudalism as like a productive ideology has to come out of, um, of that, that, that system, because the actual way of life of people had changed so much that people had returned much more into like rural spread out communities versus sort of being concentrated in like a major, uh, metropolis or, you know, or a town. Um, and that's why you start to see, you know, this, what he calls the, as he calls them, he calls them the robber, the robbing nobles, um, you know, coming to power and then to protect themselves. What do they have to do? They have to create feudal kingdoms. Um, this is from the text, the grouping of larger territories into feudal kingdoms was a necessity for the landed nobility. As for the towns, the organization of the ruling class, the nobility had therefore everywhere a monarch at its head and he's using this to like make like an actual like universal is argument universalist argument about like the development of, of history globally right you see that as you start moving into these early feudal systems of production the monarchy grows in like tremendous um in tremendous fashion into becoming like the at least in parts of the world like the dominant form of both like legal and also um, material production that it's all sort of incorporated into this. And again, it's like, this is a material understanding of politics versus like, you know, everybody coming together and being like, you know what, we need to have like blood gods um, to, to rule over society, actually it being a kind of necessary function of society to maintain the, the power and productive system of, of, of feudalism. Right. But yeah, yeah. Um, so let's, I know, I, I mean, to cut you out, the language bit is really important, right? Yeah, in yeah. I mean, four. it's uh, section four, the essence of the materialist conception of history. Um, let's see, what's a good... Uh, the production of ideas and conceptions of consciousness is at first directly interwoven with the material activity, the material intercourse of men, the language of real life. Conceiving thinking, the mental intercourse of men appear at this stage as direct influx of the material behavior. Um, um, men are the producers of the concepts. I mean, we're kind of getting back to a little bit of the foyer box stuff uh, mm-hmm. here a little bit, aren't we? Absolutely. Um, but he's, you know, making the argument about where these things sort of develop out. Cause like language becomes like a big point of contention in, in philosophy, like early days there. And then it starts to become really like 20th century philosophy. If you ever jump into it, it's gonna be a lot about language. Like that's just like what becomes dominant. Mm-hmm. But he's making an argument about like, OK, so language is something that people are like, this is, you know, ideology is produced here, like a lot of things are, are done through language. But where does, you know, how does language develop? It comes out of a direct need for production, for human society, for us to be able to communicate um, with uh, with one another. And um, um you know, so like understanding where that starts to develop from i mean i have this longer section um that i think is is an important read here this famous um his famous line um i just want to make sure i'm not skipping over anything before we get to it um but you know he makes argument ideas conceptions and uh, of consciousness is directly interwoven with the material activity and the material intercourse of men uh, the language of real life conceiving thinking the mental intercourse of men appear at this stage as the direct efflux of uh, their material behavior, what you were just saying. Um, The same thing applies to mental production as expressed in the language of politics, laws, morality, religion, uh, metaphysics of a people, right? Men, the producers of their conceptions, ideas, real active men, as they are conditioned by a definite development of their productive forces and of the intercourse corresponding to these up to its um, furthest form. So like this is talking about how all of these ideas, right? Our relations are, are things that are produced by active people, 
people living in society and fitting in ideologically or culturally or in the form of law, like quite literally, you know, maintaining those kind of productive relations. And this is where his big dig, this is, this is like, if you want to sum up this piece um, in, in a short, short section, um, this is like Marx's real break with idealism and into materialism. Consciousness can never be anything else than the conscious existence and the existence of men in their actual life process. If in all ideology, men and their circumstances appear upside down, as in the ca camera obscura, this phenomenon arises just as much from their historical life process as the inversion of objects on the retina does from their physical life process. And for, if, you, if you're not familiar with what he means there by the camera obscura, you know, it's the image is flipped in the camera obscura, right? It's upside mm -hmm. down. Um, so he's talking about that's the relationship between ideas and 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 man, right? And it's like in, in material reality. Um, going f f further, in direct contrast to German philosophy, which descends from heaven to earth, here we ascend from earth to heaven. Heaven. So it's this recognition that like the ideas of heaven, the the ideas that govern our society. Um, are not things that come down and sit and impose themselves on society versus actually something that's emanating from production, from the real existing life of people into our conceptions of heaven, of law, of morality. Um, going back to the text, that is to say, we do not set out from what men say, imagine, conceive, nor from men as narrated, thought of, imagined, conceived in order to arrive at men in the flesh. We set out from real active men, and on the basis of the real life process, we demonstrate the development of the ideological reflexes and echoes of this life process. The phantoms formed in the human brain are also necessarily sublimates of their material life process, which is empirically verifiable and bound to material premises. Morality, religion, metaphysics, all the rest of ideology and their corresponding forms of consciousness thus no longer retain the semblance of independence. They have no history, no development, but men developing their material production and their material intercourse alter along with their real existence, their thinking and the products of their thinking. Life is not determined by consciousness, but by but consciousness by life. In the first mm -hmm. method of approach, the starting point is consciousness taken as the living individual. In the second method, which conforms to real life, it is the real living individuals themselves, and consciousness is considered solely as their consciousness. And like, we should take some time to like to talk about this a little bit. I mean, I have two quick examples. Like Sam Harris, um, friend of the show, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like. Uh, endless reaction. I love what Noam Chomsky says about him. He's a religious fanatic who worships the state. Um, you know, has this line about the Quran versus the Bible um, or, you know, Buddhist texts. And he says, if you created an island with like three different societies and you just plop down upon them, the Bible, um, the Quran, or like the teachings of Buddhism, you would have like three very different societies if you came back 300 years. And um, that is just such a bonkers and anti-scientific way of looking at society. It's like the actual um, embodiment of like idealism, right? Where it's like the mm -hmm. texts themselves are what are creating society versus society creating the text. So one, it's absurd um, unless Sam Harris actually believes in the gospel, right? That like God, you know, came down um, to earth to, to, to share these teachings. Um, it, uh, um, you know, he's he's creating like a holy relationship um, between these these ideas, like a metaphysical relationship between these ideas and society versus society actually producing these ideas. It's also absurd if you look at the history of Christianity, Christianity being very, very different things for very, very different periods of time. Um, you see that development in all religions, right? Like what? <laughs> excuse me. You know. It's why you have like things like liberation theology, um, which look at Jesus throwing the money changers out of the temple. Um, look at lines like, you know, it's easier um, to thread a, a camel through the eye of the needle than it is to get into heaven, uh, than for a rich man to get into heaven. Um, you know, as as not being sort of the guiding focus, for example, of the American evangelical movement today. Um, you know, so like that that is like an idealist understanding of 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 history that is you see in in Harris. Um, another example is like, these things can be very foreign. I, I, I guess this is a uh, part of like my, um, uh, gospel is like, I really love the, the Northman movie. I think it, it did not get mm. the respect that it needed. 
But one of the points about it um, that I think I think the reason it didn't take on popular, it, it didn't get so I mean whatever without focusing on on its box box office. Start relitigating the Northman. <laughs> the Northman. No, the, there's there's a point here because the Northman um, was a great film in my opinion because if you haven't seen it. Um, it's, you know, it's an epic tale set in, 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 in the Viking age and Eggers made a real point of doing like Viking morality with the main characters, wherein they were worried about like their honor getting into Valhalla, um, and, um, made decisions based on that kind of morality. And it makes sense if you were a Viking and you are from, a um, well, I know Vikings are verb, whatever. Like if you are like a raider, you come from a place that is very destitute. So therefore your society needs you to go out and raid and pillage and take um, material from other parts of the world and return those back uh, to your homeland. Is it surprising that there is an ideology that basically is trying to turn all young people into like killing fighting warrior warriors? Um, that like there is like a belief that if you die in battle, like that is the greatest honor, right? It is a one to one, like the needs of society were to have people go out and raid and pillage and put themselves at risk um, in order to make that society function. So, of course, that's the morality that develops. And the reason I, I bring up the Northmen instead of just focusing on the Viking thing is like a lot of times when we do historical movies in the US, like I think Gladiator, which is a great film, um, but Gladiator really embodies this. Um, where, you know, instead of it having like a Roman morality and understanding of, of virtue and, and like living in society, there's a very kind of like American, like I want to return um, to my family and like take care of like those that I love versus like in the Northman where he rejects that he doesn't he doesn't go back and like spend time with his family at the end of the day and say like, all right, I'm leaving war behind. He says, I'm going to fucking die. Um, I don't want to spoil the movie, but like I'm going to just like die on a cold rock uh, versus like returning to like a life of, of, of comfort, because that's my right. understanding of like my being. You know, I bring that up just like sometimes when you look at those older societies, like their morality can be extremely foreign to you um, because we don't live in the same conditions. And therefore, our morality and understanding of like what is good, what is right, what we should be doing is something that is actually produced versus something that's sort of coming from heaven to humanity. It's something that's coming from the conditions of our society um, into our own heads. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's like civil war notes where guys are like, you know, I am going to stay here with the, for another tour because this is, and even like the Confederates are like, it's, yeah. and some guys did go back to be with their families, but you, you see like that sort of honor. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, yeah. And then he, he goes on to say, um, talking about the materialist analysis, its premises are men, not in any fantastic isolation or rigidity, but in their actual empirically perceptible process of development under definite conditions. As soon as the active life process is described, history ceases to be a collection of dead facts, as it is with mm. the empiricists, um, or an imagined activity of imagined subjects as with the idealists. Um, and, you know, he goes on to basically note the importance of history. I don't know if you had anything um, that you wanted to add there, but basically saying, you know, history is a very important thing for philosophy. Um, and in fact, in a lot of ways makes philosophy uh, uh, a second, um, a second tier way of uh, thing to engage in uh, versus yeah. like the actual material study of society. Is this a section where he mentions, or is that later where he mentions the cherry tree? I think it's the later, but he's mm -hmm. talking about, I think Feuerbach talking about the sensuous existence of a cherry tree, but like you need to historicize cherry trees because they weren't there, but yeah. for, you know, Columbus, right? Um, and that whole, uh, the, for they, they're for a new world transplant. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, I, I mean, I, that's not something uh, you need to tell me. I, as somebody who <laughs> privileges history over philosophy. Um. And yeah, so let's get into this next section here. History, uh, history, Jesus Christ, history, fundamental conditions. Um, and rather than read through the whole section, I, I have some bullet points to understand it is like to make history, men must be in a position to live. This is um, the first historical act is uh, mm. the first historical act is thus the productions of the means to satisfy these needs, the production of material life itself. And indeed, this is a historical act, a fundamental condition of all history, which today, as thousands of years ago, must daily and hourly be fulfilled merely in order to sustain human life. 
Um, I'll just go on. Uh, even with when the sensuous sensuous so uh, world is reduced to a minimum to a stick, as with Saint Bruno Bauer, um, he's taking a dig at him there. It presupposes the action of producing the stick. Um, therefore, in any interpretation of history, one has first of all to observe this fundamental fact and all of its significance and all of its implications, and to accord it its due importance. You know, so um, we have been producing food and other things um, to survive from the get go of human society. And he's saying this work is still ongoing. And as you know, these systems become more complicated, um, new needs, new contradictions, new tensions in history uh, develop out of it. Um, but the first fundamental condition of, of history is that we have to be in a position to live, right? I think, uh, you know, fairly basic, but a lot of people skip over that. Um, and they make production like a lot of philosophy. Uh, treats production as a secondhand um, effect of society. And this really, I think, des uh, delineates like Marxists um, from a lot of even other um, popular like left wing uh, philosophies, right? It's like it's production at the end of the day, which is like where you need to be, um, you know, the, the beginning of your analysis needs to be dealing with that. And a lot of like bourgeois philosophy, like treats like production as a kind of like after effect of society instead of the fundamental um relation um he also notes that like the satisfaction of needs creates new needs as we sort of developed earlier and that starts to create these tensions in society um one because you have to produce more things um you more specialization in work and also um the relations to where we live how we live um start to develop coming out of that that relationship as well Another really important of condition of history is the understanding that men make other men. We reproduce ourselves, right? So that, you know, versus like a kind of individualistic or individual view of, of society where like you yourself um, alone are like the individual and then you're like thrown into society. Marx is making the argument that no, it's actually society that is creating um, individuals, both through like education and things like social reproduction, like learning the language, like being educated, all of that, but also like in the actual physical understanding of like, we create other human beings. So in order for you to exist, like your family, you know, your parents had to be able to exist. Um, and like that production creates um, more people. So like, there's like the, the really basic level of like, actual reproducing of human beings, and then the kind of reproducing of beings into society. And those things actually aren't as easily separated as like some people try to treat them. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and interspersed in all this is a lot of shots at German philosophy <laughs> yes. being backwards. Um, but yeah, like you get that and you see that, you know, if you look at like the British Empire in, in India, for instance, in like the uh, 19th century, uh, it was a uh, you were going there for opportunity um mm -hmm. if you were a, you know, a young uh british uh, uh male um to like you know enforce the raj and then by the t like the 1920s and 30s it's like delinquent and it's less able to like excite people and you're not reproduce like the the sons of the people who were running it are looking for other types of opportunities elsewhere and things like that yeah ab no absolutely and like um then the family is obviously a very fundamental block of, 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 of human society. It's one of the earliest forms, um, he argues, but he also argues that the family was created to meet needs. Um, and the family also becomes subordinate um, as population grows and new needs arrive. So like this early form, like at first the family becomes extended into like the sense of like the tribal sense in history. Um, and then as like society continues to grow and become more complex, um, the family also becomes sub subordinate to the, those needs. And I'll just read um, a little bit from this text. Um, the production of life, both of one's own in labor and a fresh life in procreation, now appears as a double relationship. On the one hand, as a natural, on the other, as a social relationship. By social, we understand the cooperation of several individuals, no matter under what conditions, in what manner and to what end. It follows from this that a certain mode of production or industrial stage is always combined with a certain mode of cooperation or social stage. And this may this this mode of cooperation is itself a productive force. Further, that the multitude of productive forces accessible to men determine the nature of society, hence that the history of humanity must also be studied and treated in relation to the history of industry and exchange. 
But it is also um, clear how in Germany it is impossible to write this sort of history because the Germans lack not only the necessary power of comprehension and the material, but also the evidence of their senses. For across the Rhine, uh, you cannot have any experience of these things uh, since history has stopped happening. And, you know, he's making, um, you know, these these pushes. It's always funny to hear Marx go on about the Brits or the French, like, you know, different national peoples having these kind of understandings. But he's making an argument like the popularity of, of certain philosophies in, in Germany are, are very, very limited in being able to understand this historical process um, because they mm -hmm. overdetermine certain things. Yeah. And uh, I mean, um, I, I think about it like in modern terms, uh, how if people are like, I'm just thinking of, you know, when I went to college, um, before that, the 2000s, you had like the smartest people were going into financial engineering and becoming quants mm -hmm. and learning how to like, uh, cause that's where the money was. And then subsequently following that, there was the rise of like the coders and like all mm -hmm. the, like, like those sorts of people. And it's all, it just seems like whatever it's, whatever the money wants, that's going to create a new type of guy that is going to le be a leading sort of type in society. And um, you noted this earlier, um, like that's like, like a very like clear and modern understanding of like, um, you know, how, how like the changes in, in, in production, um, you know, affect like people's lives and what they end up doing. But he goes on to talk about language and he says, language is as old as consciousness. Language is practical consciousness that exists only for other men, which I think is an interesting way to put it. Right. And, and for that reason alone, it really exists for me personally as well. Language like consciousness only arises from the need, the necessity of intercourse with other men. Um, where there exists yeah, a relationship, well, it exists for me. The animal does not enter into relations with anything. It does not enter into any relation at all. For the animal, its relation to others does not exist as a relation. Consciousness is... Therefore, from the beginning, a social product and remains so as long as other as men exist at all. Consciousness is at first, of course, merely consciousness concerning the immediate sensuous environment and consciousness of the limited uh, connection with other persons and things outside the individual who's growing self-conscious. At the same time, it is the consciousness of nature, which first appears to men as completely alien, all powerful and unassailable force with which men's relations are purely animal and by which they are um, overawed like beasts. It is thus a purely animal consciousness of nature, natural religion, just because nature is at yet hardly modified historically. And like, you know, he'll go on, you know, go on to argue. It's like the fact that we are able to start to um, interact with, with nature, right. To be able to build things that like utilize natural forces for our own benefit. I mean, think about, you know, dikes and dams, right? Like th this like fundamentally changes our relationship. Um, with with nature and zooming back just a second like you know the language which is like the fundament like that's how you think right you think in the language um that is something that too is like even though it might feel like individual to you that is something with like the handprints of of society all over it right um because it doesn't make sense like to talk to yourself right like yeah. and everything you know like ultimately like like and and that that's a it's a pretty profound thing because of how natural language is to humankind that it just proves like basically we're uh to get uh as reductive as possible like hardwired to communicate with people and uh um like any sort of i don't know i, I think it's very interesting like no, it's, it's a social production and all knowledge is like a social product um basically should we jump into private property and communism? Yeah, I'll play the uh, first section. This is, the, I think, maybe the most famous uh, section um, from uh, from the German ideology here. Private property and communism. With the division of labor, in which all these contradictions are implicit, and which in its turn is based on the natural division of labor in the family and the separation of society, into individual families opposed to one another, is given simultaneously the distribution, and indeed the unequal distribution, both quantitative and qualitative, of labor and its products, hence property. The nucleus, the first form of which, lies in the family, where wife and children are the slaves of the husband. <laughs> 
This latent slavery in the family, though still very crude, is the first property. But even at this early stage it corresponds perfectly to the definition of modern economists who call it the power of disposing of the labour power of others. Division of labour and private property are, moreover, identical expressions. In the one the same thing is affirmed with reference to activity, as is affirmed in the other with reference to the product of the activity. Further, the division of labour implies the contradiction between the interest of the separate individual or the individual family and the communal interest of all individuals who have intercourse with one another. And indeed, this communal interest does not exist merely in the imagination as the general interest, but first of all in reality, as the mutual interdependence of the individuals among whom the labour is divided. And finally, the division of labour offers us a first example of how, as long as man remains in natural society, that is, as long as a cleavage exists between the particular and the common interest, as long, therefore, as activity is not voluntarily but naturally divided, man's own deed becomes an alien power opposed to him, which enslaves him instead of being controlled by him. For as soon as the distribution of labour comes into being, each man has a particular exclusive sphere of activity, which is forced upon him, and from which he cannot escape. He is a hunter, a fisherman, a herdsman, or a critical critic, and must remain so if he does not want to lose his means of livelihood. While in communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production, and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticise after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. The fixation of social act That's uh, about as utopian as uh, Marx will sound, I feel like. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a fundamental break, like, you know, here he's envisioning communism as uh, um, a fundamental break um, with a, a way of being that has been with us since we first were able to um, start to organize ourselves in, in a system that had a division of labor, right? Um, and, you know, there's talking about alienation, you know, these are, are basically like, as, as society progresses and our productive capacities grow, um, we in sense become like enslaved to that capacity because your entire life becomes defined by what you do right you become a hunter or you become a critic or you become a trader or whatever um and you know he's actually arguing that communism is is a fundamental breaking um with this and and rectifying the um um, the contradiction that as we are better able to meet our material needs we actually become even more enslaved um, to the production of, um, you know, what is necessary for our, uh, for our, you know, our, our, our basic needs and basic production. Um, and, and communism is the way out to actually live in a, a, a society, which is able to produce, um, not just basic subsistence, but expand upon that to create abundance. Um, and not only is it a system of abundance, but it's actually a system of, of, of freedom, which no longer sort of condemns you to, one area of specialization of, of, of work over another. Yeah. It's, I mean, fascinating, like writing that being a little bit close to medieval times, which is the time period where people were getting the name Wheeler or Carter or Cooper, like, mm. which are literal occupations. Uh, right. Like, it, like those are, um, um, uh, and so like, yeah, like that's a, that's a, I don't know how much more profound you could say, like your name is Wheeler yeah. because you make, your family makes wheels. <laughs> yeah, like my last name's Silver, um, because mm. that's what it means. Um, it means like uh, Silver Hills, right? And it's like, um, you know, you become defined by like what it is that your society is producing. I don't know if we were necessarily silver miners or smiths or anything like that, but um, right. you know, you're becoming defined by by these things. I know that's a really interesting point. Like, I mean, 
um, you know, this is less of a political, I mean, I shouldn't say it's not political, but this is less of like a roadmap to these things, but much more like a recognition, recognition of like these fundamental contradictions of, of human society, um, and sort of outlining how we can find a way out of them. And, um, again, I think that this is like a, a really important, um, definition because, you know, there is nothing like inherent in you that makes you into one of these things. Right. Mm. It's not like you have a part of your soul. It's actually like, uh, you know, that it makes you, you know, an angler. Um, but rather that society produce, you know, you get produced in society in a certain way that like, um, you know, either directs you like l- looking at it as, at its in its best form. Maybe directs you what you're best suited for. Right. Yeah. Or just, you know, slots you into what is is um, is, is, is needed in, in your community. What, what, you know, what production was, you know, needs to be fulfilled by like your, your labor. Um, yeah. And, you know, so it's an interesting thing is like, as we become more complex, as we become more capable of providing, uh, we actually sort of enslave ourselves, um, you know, to, to, to that, that process. And this is a way out. Yeah. And it's like, I do feel like people's brains are too thinking like I'm inherently a this or that. Like, I mean, even the way people think about like math, like I inherently, and I do like, I'm not super mathematic, but I also think like that might be somewhat uh, Mm self-imposed. And, and, and you, you start to think of yourself like, oh, I couldn't do that. Well, it's like, you might, if you had the opportunity and time to be able to like teach yourself, you actually might be able to do uh, like, you know, be an audio engineer or ride a horse or whatever the hell it is. Yeah, no, exactly. And like, this is like, you know, this is why, I mean, are we, um, would we be skipping ahead too much if we got into the, the last section of history as a continuous process? No, I'm ready for that. Um, you know, because you hear Marx right in other places, like very positively about things like the steam engine and all these new technologies, because they open up, um, our capability. Like this is one of, this is like I don't want to open this up to a bunch of uh, other contemporary fights, but there are some conceptions of like Marxism as like a, as like a, like a moral criticism of, of society. Right. And you see these kind of like anti-technology, anti-production things that have always been on the left, sort of like attaching themselves to Marxism in ways that I find to be very incoherent um, with the, 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 you know, the, the theory of, of, of history and of politics and of society that Marx puts out because you see him write like very eloquently, um, in favor of like all of these new technologies, um, that have rapidly industrialized society, have rapidly changed the way that people's live. Like when Marx laments, for example, the movement of people from feudalism into, into capitalism laments the wrong word, right? Because it's not like, um, Oh no! Like everything is 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 ruined, and we need to go back to some former version of like agrarian agrarian way of living. It's actually recognizing that there is a contradiction here. That as we become more advanced, as we become more capable of providing um, the the material needs for people in society, we become more and more and more um, enslaved uh, to to production. Um, than, than we should because we actually have the capability now or we're seeing the the openings um for the capability of being able to not only meet everyone's needs but to you know expand against uh, expand upon those incredibly um and um the, you know the fundamental contradiction of capitalism is that instead of it being uh, a force that sort of is like liberated people in totality um we become more and more in, enslaved to the system of production and the argument is not to eradicate industry or to eradicate technology or to turn your back on those things it's to make those things serve us to utilize this incredible um feat in like human understanding and human science um to actually be a, a force that is of, of of liberation um for for people that can actually fundamentally break this this old and ancient specialization division of labor um that has dominated human society for so long absolutely and so you know on that like we we've come into it um you know there's only a couple more things that that he sort of argues but he you know he makes this argument that one as you see human society developing in one way it does mean that there is a sense of 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 um of, of, of history, right. Of science to this, mm. that, you know, it's not solely limited to certain parts of, of, of the world, but in fact, 
you know, this this world market, this global capitalism coming into more and more places, all of these societies with all of their particular cultures, with all of their particular histories, with all of their particular religions becoming um, subsumed into this the system, um, which means two things. One, that like we have the potential of actually creating, you know, a, a system of the whole world versus like think about like just think about the blocks of social organization that, that he outlines. Family becomes tribe. Tribe becomes town. Town um, goes in for a brief tier, period of time in antiquity into the city. And then there's a massive dispersion and, and, and lowering of, of, of human population that puts us all into this feudal system. And out of feudalism, um, we enter into, um, you know, into early forms of, 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 of capitalism. And that form of capitalism, very much in Marx's time, and we see it now, becomes a global force. Um, so we actually are moving from family, tribe, town, feudal system, um, you know, to then become feudal kingdoms um, into like the nation state. And then the hope of communism is that we can actually expand past the nation state into something that is is global. Um, he criticizes for that um, for that exact reason. Um, uh, you know, this idea of like local communism, um, because it is the immiseration globally, yeah. which creates the, po the po possibility of communism globally. Um, and I'll just read this section here. He says, empirically, communism is only possible as the act of the dominant peoples all at once and simultaneously, uh, which presupposes universal development of productive forces and the world's intercourse bound up with communism. Moreover, the mass of propertyless workers, the utter precarious position of labor, power on a mass scale, cut off from capital or even a limited satisfaction and therefore no longer merely temporarily de deprived of work itself as a s secure source of life, presupposes the world market through competition. The proletariat can thus only exist world historically, just as communism, its activity can only have a world historical existence. World historical existence of individuals means existence of individuals, which is directly linked up um, with world history. And I mean, like yeah. this is an important claim. In, uh, in, I think it's in section 1B, but he goes into the rise of manufacture versus like so craft guilds and uh, the importance of the weavers. And right, like think about weaving uh, mm -hmm. as an industry in the UK. Obviously, you're taking inputs from globally and your, the, the, um, your product is having impact on the global market. So, you know, the entire production of clothing uh, changes when uh, industry comes to mass produce it like that. I can't remember what text it is in. It might even be a letter. Um, but Marx is asked like what the position of, of communists is on the question of free trade. And mm -hmm. people get really confused by this because Marx says, well, the position of communists is that we support it. And they're like, what? What he means by that is that it's incorrect. Um, and this is like this, like, again, it goes into a lot of pathologies we see on, on, on the left today. And historically, um, you know, people don't, um, it's not that he doesn't think that, you know, free trade and like the, the growth of like the capitalist world market is not a system, um, of like deprivation and, 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 and pain for people, but it's recognizing, um, that this stage of development is absolutely necessary, um, to be able to create a, a system of, of, of communism that is, is global. And the fact is, is that like, it will happen. So by basically trying to prevent these kind of, you know, accumulations from happening, you're putting yourself in a position where you're basically kicking things down um, the road even further and hampering the potential of, of utilizing these technologies, this connectedness um, into, you know, a political world historic force, um, which was, you know, communist, uh, rev uh, you know, uh, you know, communist world uh, revolution. Yeah. And I would also just say, like, I feel like there's some contradiction between what Marx was thinking about with free trade and sort of modern intellectual property agreements among like multinationals and stuff like that. But For, for sure. Um, and I don't know, we'll just read, read this last bit and then we can, if there's anything we feel like we missed or want to add to it. Um, he, this is the last bit of, of the, um, the German ideology uh, part one. Uh, communism for us is not a state of affairs which is to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. 
We call communism the real movement, which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. And like this too, like gets into, um, you know, some of like the fundamental arguments of, of Marxism is that it's like, it is within this system that like the birth pangs of, 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 of communism are growing out of. This is also um, why sometimes thinking about communism or, or socialism as like a set of like policies, like on a docket um, is incorrect. I mean, Leo Panitz says this very well. He's like, socialism is not a set of policies. It is a process, right? It is a process of changing our relationship with production, our relationship with things and our relationships um, with society. Um, and it's, I think, really critical if you want to, you know, if you consider yourself a Marxist and you want to like utilize these understandings um, to recognize, again, that like this is not so much like, um, at least in the German ideology, like a distinct set of like social policies to be enacted as much as like the real movement of, of, of people um, which is clawing their way towards that kind of, of, of relation. Yeah. And he's analyzing like a, a real movement, right? Like mm -hmm. a year or so after this is not published, but like, you know, f for finalized or whatever, um, you get the 1848 revolutions yeah. and, uh, probably the next Marx reading will be is probably 18th Brumaire. I think that's maybe That'd chronologically. Um, but yeah, like, um, and, and, and it's interesting to he see on both sides of 1848, you get the Marx trying to analyze in the midst of all these things, uh, happening. And then the, um, the sort of postmortem of how it didn't exactly come off. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you have it right here, folks. I mean, like, this is a very rich text. There's a lot in it. Um, but you get what the materialist view of history is in opposition to the idealist view of history. Um, you get the you you understand, I think, alienation better um, as a kind of um, as a, as an analysis than like, you know, a lot of times when people talk about alienation, it's like very individualized, like I'm alienated. Right. And certainly like that. That is how it happens. It affects you as an individual. But like you recognize that this alienation um, in, in this text, at least like that, th this alienation um comes out of the the fact that like as we are able to produce better and more we become more and more enslaved to our our needs in a, in a kind of ironic um you know contradiction which communism and and the, the socialist movement is trying to rectify um the the fact that we have the ability to produce so much that we have technology that can better our lives and yet we become more and more enslaved to our needs than ever before maybe one way to think about this is that like, you know, for Marx, like one thing that really affected his life was when he was f finishing up school and he got a job at a newspaper, I can't remember the name of it, but he went to some kind of rural part of Germany. And as private property is starting to expand in Germany, um, the, the forests, which were always sort of considered to be communal property become private property. Um, and despite the fact that there's actually material wealth, like the fact that the trees are still there, the poor farmers aren't allowed to go and chop down the trees because they don't own it. Um, and they they die in the winter, like significant amounts of people die, not because of um, a lack of, um, you know, material resources, but because of the way that under the system material resources are um, distributed, right? Like our productive capacity expands and we actually have people dying of, of man-made uh, crises. You know, you look at things like the potato famine in Ireland. It wasn't um, because there wasn't enough food. It's because food was being shipped off um, to markets in England. Um, and recognizing that as like capitalism starts to become the dominant mode of production in society, we have all this ability to produce. Um, and yet, because of the very system and function of, of, of capitalism, we have to create immiseration, which is a world historic um, shift actually that you know we move from things being from being sort of governed by nature and chance and things like that to actually being governed entirely by um, or largely by human society and then the you know inequities and, and problems that we see in society are of our own making um, and mm -hmm. sort of pushing you know the, the communist you know ideas pushing back on this alienation that treats these things as one natural forces or natural um, economic laws and rather things that are created by human beings and um, I think this is just like, uh, it's an extremely rich text and, um, coming back to it, it's, you know, I think the first time I read it, I got a decent amount. Um, but, but, you know, it's one of those things that 
you know, as you spend more time reading and, and, and understanding these things, you will always be rewarded, I think, with returning to this text. So if you haven't read it, it's a good time to jump in. It's very accessible, I think. Or, um, I least. think it's as far as the what we've read so far, I think it's maybe the most accessible. At least there's sections in it that are as clear as I think Marx has gotten. I t- and, you know, and if you have read it before, I actually think it's a great time to jump back in because you can do it and, you know, um, Maybe you'll pick up some stuff that you might have missed the first time or understand arguments better. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the German ideology, y'all. That's a fascinating text. There you go. All right, folks. Yeah, what do we uh, what do we got for folks on Tuesday? Going back right into history with our friend Harvey J.K. Um, talking about uh, the British Marxist historians' his, uh, re-release of his his famous um, book. So I hope you all join us for that uh, next Tuesday at seven central. All right, peace, folks.